Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the world you happen to be. And a very special Carnegie Endowment welcome to any viewers who might be live streaming from Europe or South Asia, which are the two regions that are at the core of the project whose results we're launching at Carnegie today. And before I do anything else, I want to call your attention to this larger project, which we called China's Impact on Strategic Regions, and to the two fantastic studies that resulted from it. One is a deep dive into Chinese activism and local response in four European countries, Georgia, Greece, Hungary, and Romania. And the other is a deep dive into the same phenomena in four South Asian countries, Bangladesh, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And you can download the two reports on our website, carnegieendowment.org, and not just in English, by the way, but also in five of the languages of these eight case countries, because we've translated the reports into Greek, Hungarian, Bangla, Nepali, and Sinhala. I'm Evan Feigenbaum. I'm a vice president for studies at Carnegie. I'm also the co-leader of this project on Chinese influence on the one hand, and on the other, local vulnerabilities and resilience. All of that together with my colleague, Eric Bratberg, who directs Carnegie's Europe program in Washington, and an absolutely fabulous team of Carnegie scholars in the United States, in Europe, and in South Asia. Deep Paul, Philippe Lacour, Tom DeWall, and Paul Stronsky. Now, I'm just going to explain the project briefly so you have context on what we did and why, and then I'll introduce the panel who will not so much discuss our reports as talk about issues and themes that are at the core of them. Now, it's obvious to everyone that China's economic and political footprint are expanding very quickly. So quickly, in fact, that many countries, even those with relatively strong state and civil society institutions, have struggled to grapple with the implications. And to be very blunt about it, countries where the gap is greatest between the scope and intensity of Chinese activism on the one hand, and on the other, local capacity to manage and mitigate political and economic risks of all kinds, and from all perspective sources, face special challenges. So to address those gaps and challenges, we at Carnegie initiated a project about a year ago to better understand Chinese activism in eight pivot countries in two strategic regions. And our project had three objectives. The first was to enhance local awareness of the scope and nature of Chinese activism in what we called vulnerable countries. And we had a very specific definition of vulnerability. These are countries with at least one or more of three characteristics. They either have brittle state institutions and or fragile civil societies and or countries where elite capture is a feature of the political landscape. Second then, our project aimed to strengthen capacity by facilitating a sharing of experiences and best practices across countries. And then third, the project sought to develop policy prescriptions for these countries, as well as the United States and its partners. So we started by holding workshops so that influencers across the countries in each region could share experiences and compare notes. And the invited participants included policymakers, experts, journalists, others, all of them with very deep local knowledge, steeped in their country's politics, economies, and civil societies. These were cross-national discussions among regional participants. So they aimed to raise awareness, discuss the implications of China's growing activism in their countries, and then compare notes across borders. Then after holding the workshops, our Carnegie team conducted extensive interviews and a comprehensive review of open source data and literature on Chinese activities. And this included very extensive media monitoring in local languages, from Bengali to Nepali, from Georgian to Greek. These local deep dives aim to measure Chinese influence on three dimensions. First, Chinese activities that might shape or constrain the choices and options for local political and economic elites. Second, Chinese activities that influence or constrain the parameters of local media 
and public opinion. And then last, China's impact on local civil society and academia. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. China is going to quite naturally play a big role all over the world because China's sheer size means that it will inevitably play an economic and even strategic role in these two geographies and in every other global geography for that matter. So the reality is that economic gravity is a powerful force and countries in these and other regions will invariably and not very surprisingly want to tap the economic opportunities in particular that China provides. So for that reason, our team surveys aim to analyze only those specific activities that could constrict local options, reduce the scope of local choice, and reward a local interest group or elite. In other words, these papers are not just about Chinese activism. They are to an even greater degree about systemic vulnerabilities in the countries themselves how to build resilience in order to channel China's inevitable energies in directions that are maximally productive and beneficial for these and other countries themselves. So in a nutshell, we've tried in these two reports to explore all of the dimensions of Chinese activism simultaneously in an effort to generate a clearer and well-balanced picture of Chinese influence in Europe and South Asia. And we've fostered a cross-national network who will continue to compare notes and learn across national boundaries to spur a genuinely regional conversation about China's rise and its implications. So I encourage you to read the reports. They're terrific. In my view, they're wholly unique. They're interesting conceptually and empirically. And I encourage you to tune in next week when we have two more launch events, one on Europe, one on South Asia. Now, to discuss these, and related themes today. Let me quickly introduce our panel. Our moderator is Mary Kay Magstead, who served as China correspondent for the PRI BBC radio program, The World, and previously covered the world, but especially China for National Public Radio. She's now at the Asia Society. And Mary Kay is joined by former foreign and finance ministers from three of the eight case countries in these two reports. First, my friend Iftikhar Chowdhury, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh and is now at the National University of Singapore, a very interesting perch, by the way, from which to observe Chinese influence around the world. George uh, Papa Constantino was the Greek Minister of Finance, as well as Greece's Minister of Energy and Environment. He's now at the European University Institute. And Eka Eshalashvili was Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, and Justice Minister of Georgia. She's now at Management Systems International. I'm incredibly excited about this discussion. I thank all of them for joining us. And with that, let me turn it over to Mary Kay to drive the discussion. Mary Kay, over to you. Well, thank you, Evan. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be having this conversation with all of you on the panel. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to draw just for a couple of moments on my experience for 15 years as a correspondent in China and also on the work I did in a recent podcast on China's New Silk Road, which looked at China's investments around the world and how they were seen and what impact they were having in on five continents. And I, I think there are just a few things that are important to kind of keep in mind as framing devices, both in terms of China's approach and what some of the experience of recipient countries are and also about you know, maybe what the US could learn um, about both of those things. Um, and before I launch into that, I just wanna let you know um, that we'll be taking questions. Um, we'll have a conversation for about half an hour, 35 minutes, and then we'll turn to your questions um, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. This, this whole uh, event will be an hour. Um, so China, uh, a lot has been said about the Belt and Road Initiative and China's investments and global um, activities in general, but it is, I think, the case that China has clear long-term goals, economic, political, and strategic, and the way that China invests is tied into all of these goals. Um, Xi Jinping has specifically called it the China dream. It's kind of to make China great again in the world. It's this idea that China has a role to play as a premier global power, if not the premier global power. So when you look at investments, while some of them are just investments, there's almost always, uh, in addition to that, a strategic component. There could be a dual use component. There's um, a political consideration, uh, whether it's soft power, whether it's to just create closer ties with a particular country or to have an entry into a region. 
Um, China is pragmatic in how it pursues its goals, depending on a recipient country's capacity, its political system, its legal environment, and the strength of its civil society and media. And that speaks directly to the content of these Carnegie reports. Um, China can be opportunistic in taking advantage of weaker countries with needs that are not being met by other investors. Um, China can be and has been in some cases high handed and heavy handed. Um, some of its loan terms are opaque. Um, in, in some cases, there's even a clause in the loans that says that <clears throat> the recipient country isn't allowed to even talk about the fact that the loan exists. Um, there is often political leverage built in. Like if your government does something that's against China's interests, we could call in the whole loan. Um, China has, the Chinese government has had blind spots about how um, some of its actions are perceived and how countries will react both to their own experiences and to the experience of, experiences of others. And that was very much seen uh, in response to the event in 2017 in Sri Lanka, where a Chinese state-owned company gained uh, a 99-year ma majority stake in the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota in, to pay for, in part, some of the debt that um, that Sri Lanka owed on that port. So from the perspective of recipient countries, there's I, I think it's really important to keep in mind that not all Chinese projects are bad. Many of them actually have a positive effect. And recipient countries are making choices in, in quite often, if not usually, based on their own interests. So you know they have a real desire for better lives um, uh, or it, within the country, a need for infrastructure and other investments that aren't being met elsewhere. Um, they're drawn by China's ability to invest in, invest big amounts and to complete projects quickly. In some cases, particularly in less democratic countries, they're drawn by the lack of conditionality, the lack of scrutiny of uh, quality of governance. Um, many say that they would like more alternatives and more reliable, consistent ones. Uh, what I heard when I was reporting my On China's New Silk Road podcast with the Global Reporting Center was, give us a better option. If you don't want us to be taking Chinese money, give us a better option. And then also, um, despite the fact that China has been investing widely around the world, positive sentiment has cooled in many regions um, as countries have experienced that what they had expected isn't necessarily the win-win <clears throat> that had been promised um, when, once it plays out on the ground. And finally, um, for the US, um, the United States is still seen in many parts of the world as being inadequately engaged and offering limited and piecemeal investment. Um, again, China was filling a gap that the U.S. was not filling. And there's a lot of room for improvement. President Biden is starting to move in that direction. Uh, in the recent Quad Summit with India, Japan, Australia, and the U.S., leaders agreed to focus on vaccines, emerging technologies, and climate. There's also the new U.S. Build Back Better World Initiative and the Blue Dot Network. There's an EU Asia Infrastructure Initiative. Japan and India are cooperating and building infrastructure in Myanmar and Sri Lanka and elsewhere. So the U.S. in general, I think, needs to better understand how recipient countries view their choices, how they make their decisions on where to turn for investment and more, and how the U.S. could help those countries be stronger negotiators with China and other investors. And that's a point that's made in these reports. Um, and again, it's important to understand that not everyone in the world sees China as a bad actor or Chinese investment as a bad thing. There's a lot of, admi of admiration of what China has accomplished and what it can offer. Um, and just as an example, going outside of the scope of, of these particular reports, African public opinion polls um, show that there's about 60% positive sentiment toward China in, I think it was a couple dozen countries um, surveyed by the Afrobarometer Independent Survey Group. So turning to this panel, um, I'd like to start by just sort of getting a sense of, of views of China. And I'd really like to start with your own personal experience within your lifetime of how you view China and the relevance it has to your country's interests. So even going before you were in government, um, you know, kind of where did, you know, what did you see when you saw China as you were growing up, as you were a young adult, and then once you were in government and, and how has that shifted over time? Um, and if, if the car, could we start with you? Well, thank you very much, Mary Kay. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and delight and honor to be with in such a distinguished company, uh, particularly my uh, very distinguished colleagues from, from Greece and, and Georgia. 
Uh, yes, okay. I mean, I grew up in a family which was actually mostly involved with generations in diplomacy or civil service administration. I uh, knew uh, somewhat China quite well since my childhood. I had brothers, who are, uh, two of them have a posted in China as diplomatic positions in the early 60s. But let me tell you the sense of China uh, from Bangladesh for, for the average uh, man on the clap of omnibuses in, in, in Bangladesh. There is an admiration for, 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 uh, for China, remarkable domestic achievements. And never has a country grown at such rapid uh, pace doubling uh, its economy every seven years. Now, in 1978, the economy was only 5% of America's. By 2030, it's slated to overtake the United States, having already done so in PPP terms. There is also an understanding my, uh, in our parts, and I want to underscore this, that, uh, that uh, they see it as, a, 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 as an accept, well, as a normal thing for China to want to build kinetic and non-kinetic military capabilities commensurate with its ever burgeoning political cloud. Now, second, I'll just make three quick points. The Chinese are not viewed as a nation that is a, an existential threat uh, to the sovereignty of others, uh, not to our sovereignty, certainly. Uh, they have so long lived by, and that's how, how we see them, as by global club views, that by others perhaps, but particularly the West. But now that they believe that they are sufficiently powerful, they want to write some of those rules themselves. The Chinese do not normally interfere, and I think it's also reflected in the reports of the domestic politics of others, uh, unlike uh, some of their major uh, global peers that we have known, but appears to push development as a foreign policy trap, which in a world can probably say 85% of developing nations finds considerable resonance. Third, uh, my last point here is, is their model, I mean, which is rooted in Confucian uh, ethos, uh, found some appreciation in these parts, particularly say, borrowing from others now uh, and making them better by melding with the tone. Now, ideologically, Chinese have uh, uh, even Confucianized the Communist Party. Now, Communist Party is something that we have known in our part of the world, in the Indian subcontinent, strong Communist Party in the, in the past. Today, we see the Chinese in some ways, in fact, modernizing the Communist Party and bringing it in line with their own values. Now, even something as simple as flying a kite, for instance, I mean, they'll bring in the Hegelian dialectical context of, of content of overcoming adversity. Now, in governance, the uh, uh, departure for meritocracy, I mean, which is something, say, even in Singapore, we see, and to a certain, to a large extent, admire. Uh, it, it's almost platonic. I mean, you uh, you sort of uh, uh, put uh, uh, meritocracy in governor in government, and then you have the emperor or the uh, president or the first secretary is the father 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 figure. But the whole point is borrowing something from others, making adjustment, and sort of adding your own values and culture to it is something that finds appreciation in many parts of. South Asia. That is because our region also takes a modicum of pride in our own culture and find this an attractive paradigm in sort of, you know, uh, uh, using a, a, a college steel or college whatever you are, but make yourself better by learning from others. So, so that is it. These are the three quick points I wanted to make and my perceptions. I've always, as I said, known China in many since my childhood. But in, in my career, these are the differences I see from the start to now. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, George, how about you? How, how has your view of China changed throughout your lifetime related to its relevance to Greece? I uh, can't hear you. Are you. Apologies, the cardinal sin of being muted. That's all so right. I was, I was, I was thanking you and saying it was a, it's a pleasure to be here and commenting on, on, a, on a great report and discussing around it. So I'll give you three, let's say, three characteristics that would um, uh, describe China uh, some decades back as we were growing up. And I'll give you three that I think reflect the way that the average Greek would see China today. So... The ones that used to, to dominate would be one, a very simple one, China as a source of 
cheap imports. I mean, you know, the average Greek would just buy cheap Chinese toys and that would be it. That was the main. The second was Chinese communism. Um, there's, there's a strong leftist tradition in Greece. There were links always. And this experiment uh, with its, of course, its, uh, its positive and its much less positive aspects had captured the imagination of many Greeks and had followed us. And the third is that, you know, we, we see, we've always seen China as uh, an ancient civilization next to our ancient civilization. So there was, there was some parallels there to the average Greek. Now, fast forward to today, I would say that the source of Chinese imports view has been replaced but by China as a strategic investor. And, and not only by the investments that China has made in Greece, and we'll have the new talk maybe about that, but also... The, the clear footprint of China that we've seen throughout Europe. So a changing view on, on, on exactly what China does economically. The second, uh, Chinese communism and sort of a, a, a bit of, a, of an ideological view has been replaced by China as a geopolitical player. And the understanding common to, to the rest of, of the world, of course, that China is now in the big leagues and, and it is one of the, the three main blocks. And finally... The, the one that has remained the same, I would say, and we, we saw it very strongly when we gave uh, in 2004 after the Greek Olympics, a bit, where the Beijing Olympics, and kind of passed the torch, this idea of the ancient civilizations and a kindred spirit has been something that has followed throughout in the, in the Greek psyche, the relationship of the country and of the average citizen to China. So I'll, I'll stick with those. Okay, and Eka, how about in Georgia? How about you and, and your, your view of, of China and its relevance to, to Georgia? Well, for my side as well, I'm very pleased to be with all of you today and then to have a pleasure to discuss uh, issues that we will discuss today. And then congratulations to the to Carnegie Endowment with a with great report. It was a very interesting read for me myself. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm from a generation that still remembers the end uh, tale of the Soviet Union. Uh, it was crumbling at the time, so that it's a mix, mix, mix uh, of, of perceptions that I have about China. I still have remnant of the memory when China was perceived as a communist country in Georgia, something close to Soviet Union, and then less attractive because of that when it comes to ideology, and then when it comes to the value sets of the governance, so to say, in that sense. So there was no allure or attraction that in that sense China had in the Georgian psyche, or there, or there was very little knowledge to begin with that we've had about how China ran as such. It was a distant country linked to the Soviet Union, and then Soviet Union was extremely unpopular in Georgia. So China had no negative, toxic legacy in terms of perception. There was nothing attractive in it, so to say. Then we started to learn more about China. And then what George mentioned in terms of affinity with the, with the ancient culture, that started to emerge more and more. Georgia is an ancient country itself, uh, and not as, known, not as much known as Greece around the globe. But we do have that ambition as well, that with, with the roots and an ancient culture of the type that Georgia represents as well, We've, we've always had then, then we started to develop that fascination of the culture of China. And then more and more we started to learn about that. You understand how much more there is in it rather than uh, just uh, cheap imports or trade or anything that is related with finances and then the money. Now, as a continuum of that, we've had a very, very sobering, painful waking up moment already in 2006 when, when Russia cut off all the energy um, supplies to Georgia and trade routes. So Georgia, for Georgia, Russian market, which was at the time 80% of, of, of exports for Georgia and trade for Georgia was completely closed. So since then, when we've started diversification for our economy in terms of import and export and developing potential for investment, China emerged to be a very attractive and desirable partner that we started to cultivate. With whatever little resources that we've had at the time, China was not at that point as eager to develop perhaps its, its, its global uh, projects as it started afterwards, but then we started to to develop quite a bit of uh, relations already uh, from that point of view. And final point that I cannot but not to mention from my personal perspective was how much the support from China meant in 2008 when, when Russia 
aggression uh, started against Georgia and then so far continues with the occupation of 20% of the Georgian territories. In 2008, China's position was pivotal for strengthening position of Central Asian countries and not only in the countries where China had influence and leverage were for the support of Georgia's territorial integrity. That has been a steadfast systemic support to Georgia's territorial integrity ever since. And uh, this has been extremely appreciated in Georgia. And we do remember that uh, it was at the difficult times when Russia, China's support mattered a lot and it actually played a very significant role. So that's my personal personal sort of perception, a mix of that, what I can say about China, which is completely different from a new generation in Georgia. They they don't remember communist part. If you ask my children how they see China, it's more of a fascination with food, with culture, and, <laughs> and then possibilities for travel that they would want to have, I would say. Yeah. So, so interesting. We've already gotten into some of the strategic relationships, um, particularly between Georgia and China related to Russia. Um, China and Bangladesh also have an interesting strategic relationship. Um, a lot of arms sales from China to Bangladesh. Uh, China is helping to train the Bangladeshi police force. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, if, if Takar, whether you think that um, some of that cooperation is in part uh, meant to counter India's influence in the region or counterbalance it um, to give Bangladesh more options. I think you need to unmute as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, th that is true. I mean, if you uh, remember, Bangladesh is a country, uh, as is Nepal and 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 and, and Bhutan, uh, which is part of your study. No, but Nepal and okay, uh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, yeah. is India locked largely, except for you know. Uh, so uh, much the same way, uh, they're sort of uh, in a geographical situation like that, what can you do? Like, uh, for instance, the way the Finland acted at, uh, with the Soviet Union in the late 40s, early 50s, the Pekonen years, I mean, uh, you attacked uh, close to the shark in order to avoid being eaten. That was, that was one option. Uh, uh, let's forget the shark, the big fish, in order to avoid being eaten. That was one. Secondly is you could develop capabilities uh, uh, where you could get, uh, give the uh, potential adversary a uh, bloody nose, I mean, something that Sweden opted for. The third would be sort of to expand your linkages extraterritorially so that with those external linkages, you make up for the power difference uh, with, the, with the more immediate adversary. Fourth is uh, uh, something that Myanmar has been doing from time to time. You know, you drop off the, the international system altogether. We couldn't do that, obviously. Bangladesh is a very interconnected country. So yes, part of it is true. I mean, it is to make up for power, power balance with immediate neighbors. Uh, we've done, I understand, a good job in, in balancing India and China. Uh, uh, these are, uh, uh, I mean, absolute geographical necessities. We are not into the big power game that, that India would be playing, for instance. You mentioned Quad at one point in time. Uh, that is uh, generally uh, 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 not, not suspect, but held with a bit of apprehension that it might lead uh, not, just, not just countries like Bangladesh, but even Southeast Asia, where, where I live and work at this point in time, into uh, issues where we would not be, we would not like to be drawn into. And the great fear, like what happened in your part of the, I'm sorry, in, in Europe in the uh, in the uh, 20s or uh, during, before the first great war, you sort of sleepwalk into a very conflict situation. We see China as a burgeoning power, certainly, uh, uh, I mean, uh, wanting peer, uh, peer uh, 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 equality with, uh, with the United States. Uh, they want a big power relationship. You spoke of the China dream, Zhang Guomang, as they say. I mean, China dream. Okay, all that is there. But we want to be a recipient of the development cooperation projects in China, not to be drawn into those kind of uh, debates. And yes, also want to ba uh, balance with the more immediate potential source of uh, concern. You see? So that's it. Yes. Uh, uh, we would, if we have the capability, like to balance ourselves between the, between India and China. Okay. 
<clears throat> so George, you were the finance minister in Greece in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. And we're dealing with, um, you know, some, some fairly difficult decisions and the EU was, um, you know, it, and the IMF were saying, okay, well, you need to um, go through some, some tightening and some austerity measures. Um, after that, uh, or even like in, in that period and just after um, China's uh, giant state-owned enterprise, Costco, the China ocean shipping company came in, it had already taken a stake in Piraeus, I believe in 2006, but it expanded its stake and now it's a majority shareholder. And I'm just wondering in general, um, how you view uh, the approach that Costco and other Chinese investors in Greece, but especially Costco um, have taken and how much the results of these Chinese investments have squared with expectations at the time that the, that the agreements were first struck. Yeah, actually, Costco's uh, initial uh, um, foray into Paris was in 2008, before the, the, the crisis hit, mm. uh, where it was given the management of, of two peers. And it very quickly transformed the port into a much more efficient operation, increasing um, many times over, over the throughput and the like. It was clear and had been clear to us from the very beginning that this was a strategic investment in terms of sea routes, combining with possibly rail, which never materialized, uh, and other connections to, to, to the rest of Europe. Made a lot of sense from China's point of view. From Greece's point of view, we were in a situation where basically we were desperately looking around for investments. Um, the country was, uh, uh, you know, the country's GDP had collapsed. Uh, we were asked to tighten our belts uh, in exchange for the loans to be able to, to survive. And at the same time, sell state assets to reduce the country's debt. And there were no other investments in the room. Uh, there were no European investors at the time, and there were no US investors. And the reaction that uh, successive governments had to a kind of a cautious approach from the EU and from the US on Chinese investment was, well, you know, they're the only, it's the only game in town. They're the only ones willing to take risk. Now, what's interesting here to say, however, at the same time is that this was a calculated and measured risk that the Chinese government and its companies were taking. For example, China never got a significant state in Greek uh, sovereign debt. Uh, they kind of were very reluctant to, uh, to because they were approached by, by Greek governments, including by our own, in terms of, of coming in uh, uh, with some, uh, buying some of our debt in, in a difficult period not by any means large chunks but still and they were very reluctant to do that so this was they were not there to uh to to, to find a way to uh, let's say replace the eu its structures its financing mechanisms they knew they could not do that so they had a fairly rational careful approach uh, they, it was a strategic investment which could lead to more uh, in the end because you also asked did it did, did it did it realize all its potential? The answer is that only partly. And we've seen that, uh, for example, the current government has, uh, yes, uh, uh, agreed to an extension of, of the share ownership by Costco, but at the same time um, kind of had a difficult conversation in terms of, of investments that were promised and did not materialize. And then in other investments, for example, trains, uh, in the end, China did not go through and they did not bid uh, for for for, uh, uh, for trains, which would have been a natural complement to the port investment. So a difficult period, a strategic investor that comes in in a fairly opportunistic way, who changes the, the game in the specific, uh, uh, in the port, and now Piraeus is a much bigger and better port than it was before, but which kind of falls short, falls short of, of the full potential both in terms of the country and I would even argue in terms of possible Chinese interests of using Greek as a strategic investment foothold for, for further investments. Okay. Um, Eka, um, similar question. H how do you view the approach uh, Chinese investors have taken in Georgia? To what extent do you, this is a three-part question. To what extent mm -hmm. do you think they've taken advantage of vulnerabilities? That's two. And, and number three, if they have taken advantage of vulnerabilities, <laughs> Has it been different from what other foreign investors have done? 
I think Georgia is a very specific case in this case. First of all, the market is obviously small in Georgia, and then interest might be different when it comes to the Chinese investors. And it's not that they are flooding Georgia with, with uh, offers and projects or ideas, but rather it's sort of a mutual process in two-way streets, so to say, in which they could be encouraged to look into investment potentials. But then we've had these two eras, so to say, when it comes to relationships with investors. Uh, prior to 2012, um, all investors were, in, were encouraged to come in and actually were facilitated to enter the market in terms of easiness of doing business. And But the key was that there was no special treatment to any investors. Rule of law in that regard was the key framework in which they had to operate. And in that regard, even Russian investors had no significant problems if they would comply with the legal requirements and they were otherwise not bearing any significant security threats per se. So Chinese had to compete as any other investors had to compete and state institutions and judiciary had all the capacity to deal with any attempt, even if Chinese would have had to have any special treatment. Now, when it comes to the current situations of Georgia, state in institutions are much weak. There is a very specific situation of state capture, as it is called frequently, but by a local oligarch. So the local oligarch has its own view of how much control he has to have over the developments in the country. So if you look into the projects where big strategic projects that Chinese investors or China as a country might have had interest, including in the deep sea port in Anaklia, for example, they couldn't really sway that much when it comes to any leveraging that could come with the money per se, because for a small country as Georgia is, there is a man who captured the state who has all the money that he needs for actually holding the control. So in other words, he's not that eager to have that much of a share in the economy that he could give it. So in other words, for Georgia, internal situation as it is, is more of a challenge for sustainability of the democratic development of Georgia and economic growth in a, in a, in a good way, rather than Chinese potential investors that could tap into the vulnerability that exists with institutional weaknesses because they can't really benefit from that to the degree that in some other countries where there's a diversity that comes with the vulnerability of different elite groups, they could maybe leverage differently. Okay. Um, Iftikhar, what would you say are the lessons? I mean, Bangladesh, uh, Chinese investment in Bangladesh was ramped up pretty significantly, I think, from 2016 when Xi Jinping came to visit um, and, and, and there were Belt and Road agreements signed. Um, and so there, there, there's been you know, some years now of experience with uh, Chinese investments and seeing how they've been playing out within the country. What do you think are some of the lessons learned within Bangladesh? From that experience, and also since you're sitting in Singapore right now, um, what do you what do you think are some of the lessons that have been learned or could be learned from other countries uh, along the Belt and Road and or that are otherwise engaged with taking Chinese investment? Oh, you need to unmute. Uh, 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 you. Bangladesh is not actually a small country. I mean, it's the eighth largest country in the world in terms of population. And, uh, and uh, you know, we've had a long experience of uh, dealing with development cooperation partners. Uh, first is a part of Pakistan. I mean, even in, in the late 60s in Pakistan, Pakistan had reached a point where it was nearly a takeoff sta a stage. And they used to talk of uh, the uh, sort of the big push theory, Rosenstein Rodan. I mean, what you needed at that point in time was huge investments uh, uh, in order to kickstart the, the economy. Now, uh, in Bangladesh, what had happened was immediately after the war, when we had a war battered economy, this was 71, 71 onwards, we did pretty well with, with uh, Western uh, development cooperation support. Obviously, of course, even at that point in time, there was some opposition to sort of that kind of aid. Uh, th this were, as you recall, the days of the sort of a structural dependency school. I mean, believing that aid deepens dependency and you stay clear, uh, etc. Nonetheless, we made very good good use of uh, external support. Uh, I was in the planning commission at one point in time, and our job was to match donors and 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 projects. Uh, remember, project preparation is a very uh, uh, in developing countries is a very technical thing. 
we have a list of projects. It's not that the China comes and says that, okay, here's a project, we come into this. No, we have a list of projects. We match, the planning commission matches uh, projects with the donors. What we needed at that point in time in 2016 that you mentioned, that watershed point when Xi Jinping came, came to Bangladesh, is huge injections of, 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 of resources. Resources, uh, as Pakistan had earlier on, the previous decade, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Pakistan-China economic uh, uh, corridor, uh, CPEG. We got that. In 2016, uh, Xi Jinping, I think, signed about 27 or so projects, $24 billion, enormous amounts of money, that kind of thing that you hadn't done, uh, seen before, into infrastructure projects, major infrastructure projects, at a point in time when the economy was thirsting for infrastructure projects. That's exactly what we needed then. So yes, so that was a good match. Now. Uh, remember that this is not uh, this is not aid. I mean, this is on near commercial terms. Roughly two three percent uh, 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 interest. Very attractive. Now we have heard uh, we had heard, of course, a lot about this debt uh, uh, trap, etc. You know, you spoke of Hambantota. But at that point in time, I remember from Singapore, I had even asked uh, the Pakistani uh, 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 finance minister, uh, Sir Taj Aziz. I don't know if George would know him. Sartaj is an absolutely top draw uh, 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 economist. I mean, he's been with the planning commissions for, for decades. He told me that, no, there is not a problem. If you handle your debts well, I mean, uh, Sri Lanka might have made mistakes with Hambantota. I mean, we all know that now. But he seemed to believe that that was not a problem with him, as did his my colleague in Bangladesh at that point in time. So that is not a big issue. What the Chinese do is, uh, they, I mean, there isn't a tremendous balance of payment support in some ways because they, they take projects, they build, they operate, they, they, then they transfer. They've done this huge bridge that, that's there in, in, in your report. Something that we had gone to the World Bank for with problems to the World Bank, so the Chinese came in and took it up. Sometimes they have even shared mega projects with India. I mean, we have parceled out components of a project to China uh, uh, like uh, Eka was talking, the deep sea uh, or port, this thing with uh, uh, parts to India, parts to China, etc. It has worked so far so well. We haven't had a problem. In fact, even with the Western donors, we never had a problem with amortization, etc. I mean, we paid back our, uh, our dues, etc. And it seems to be working well. So China is one source of kind of support that uh, that we needed at that point in time for mega projects that we've had and remember it's not just the chinese companies they also operate through the a uh, the the Ch uh, the bank the aiib i mean that that bank uh, the the methodology is not too different from the asian development bank uh, you see so so it's a uh, uh, one advantage for the recipient is, of course, that the Chinese don't go into the conditionalities that the bank would, or don't ask for structural adjustments as, as the fund would, or or nor for uh, uh, for other conditionalities that a major Western donor would. Uh, but uh, it works well. Uh, it has worked well, mind you. Our other major partner is the European Union. It's not so much the United States. So with the European Union, we seem to be working all right with the Chinese European Union. And India, sort of in between, uh, we try to keep them happy, of course. <laughs> we seem to have managed to do that so far. Great. Um, so I have one more question I'd like to ask each of you, just a very brief reply, like an, a minute or so, and then we'll get to audience questions. What would you like Americans and the U.S. government to understand about your country's development needs and challenges? And what would you like to see from the U.S. that's not yet happening? Um, Eka, why don't you go first? Um, I would say that uh, what has been already described as a benefit, uh, what's, when something comes without conditionalities, we need opposite than that. Our main vulnerability is still weak democracies now, especially now in Georgia and then structural reforms that are needed for sustainable economic development. And I would actually argue that now countries like Georgia, countries like Ukraine, we need more robust conditionalities. We need more push for structural reforms of our economies. And we need profound uplifting of our 
processes in terms of development of democracies, and U.S. and U.S. are a best fit for that. Uh, with some countries like Georgia, they got used to, for some years, to the fact that we were front runners in terms of transformation, democratic development. Uh, we do suffer from aggression from Russia. Our territories are still occupied, both in Georgia and Ukraine, for example. So sometimes you have a feel that we they take a bit of an easy, easy um, way of pushing us, perhaps with conditionalities, understanding sensitivity of that, and then need for not unraveling sort of instability in the country. But with more refined but robust policies in that regard, I think our future in a sustainable way is, is maturity of our democracy and reforms, structural reforms, rule of law that guarantees sustainability of good investment climate and prosperity of our nations. So I would argue that more of that and more U.S. and U.S. approach, we don't need easy money, we need hard money that helps us to develop, but helps us in a way that makes us more sustainable and less vulnerable in the future. George, same question. Uh, could you unmute, please? I promise you, this does not happen to me very often. Um, I would single out two things. Uh, the, the first is that uh, the first lesson, and to, to, to say this, is that one absence has consequences. Um, so if you're absent for a very long time from a particular region, uh, because you think it's economically vulnerable and your companies don't want to take the risk, well, there are consequences to that, and you have to deal with it. The second is that that. Greece in 2021 going forward is not the Greece in the crisis. It's also not the, the Greece post-crisis with a, uh, a a sort of leftist government that saw China as, as a way to counterbalance EU influence. From now on, Greece will play fully within its EU role. So uh, it's not a question of understanding what Greece wants in its relations with China. It's a question of understanding and working with what the EU wants with its relation with China, which is not always clear, I'll grant you that, uh, but it is not exactly the same as what the US approach to China is. So uh, Greece is simply going to go along with the overall European uh, uh, position, uh, including investment screening, but also uh, less confrontational uh, than the US has been uh, in its relation with China. So that is the second part of the two. Okay. And Iftikhar, um, just briefly, what would you like to see the U.S., what would you like to see from the U.S. in Bangladesh that's not happening yet? And, and more, more broadly, if you'd like as well, since you're in Singapore and are looking at the region as a whole. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, as uh, Ekalsa said, no, no easy money. I mean, we're not there for e uh, easy money from the United States. Market access, yes. We are graduating to uh, from least developed to a mid middle income country would like greater market access if possible to the American market. We are going to uh, go to a, a higher uh, reaches of, of, of the production line. Uh, so uh, if uh, Europe is giving us market access, China is giving 97% market access to all our products. We'd like that from the United States. And another thing I, I, I had a, a glance at your report, by the way. I like the idea of dehyphenating the relations with China from from uh, from development cooperation. I mean, we are too mature a uh, uh, development cooperation partner to to get involved in hawk politic uh, uh, China America relationship. No, I mean, keep that away from us. I mean, getting. Come in where the market lets you come in. I mean, let us trade on our own. We are very close to the United States, as you understand. You speak of uh, of, of elite capture. If uh, the elite in Bangladesh have been captured by any country, it is the United States. You see, I mean, apart from the United Kingdom and, and Europe, perhaps. I mean, China has is no threat to capturing our elites uh, by any standards. But yes, capturing market, yes. Uh, economy, yes. So that's where the big uh, strike... Uh, 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 it's not a struggle. Its question is: uh, uh, This is. Did you mention win-win cooperation at one stage? It's win for Ch America, win for China. Come in together. Let's develop the the, the system. But uh, we don't want to s play out your competition uh, on our terrain, so to say. So that's it. I mean, uh, in other words, let market decide. Okay. Um so, so to audience questions, there is a question, there are actually a, a couple of questions about COVID and the pandemic. 
Um, how have, uh, and, and George, I think I'm gonna send this one to you. How have the local views of China uh, in Greece been shaped by COVID-19, including uh, mask diplomacy and vac vaccine diplomacy efforts um, and uh, the way that, that China has been shaping the discussion around those? Well, I think that it it's, it's <laughs> It has been an uphill struggle for China to be able to use mask diplomacy, um, given that that where the origination of the virus was. Uh, so, you know, despite the efforts, it did not change the fact that after uh, the beginning of, of the pandemic, um, I, I would say sentiment cooled towards towards China, and uh, and, and you know. It, it, I wouldn't say it completely reversed, but it's. I would say that it certainly had had a negative impact on the overall uh, uh, of the way that that people in Greece uh, look towards uh, the country, and also, uh, in a sense, there was a window of opportunity there before the EU got its act together. Once the EU got its act together, the kind of tokenism of the sort of plane loads of masks, etc., kind of faded in the background. So it was the, perhaps important for a few weeks. Uh, but against the backdrop of, you know, the, the virus that, that that started in Wuhan uh, and, and then kind of fade into the background. And what, what remained was a kind of much more ambivalent ad attitude, especially given that uh, the information coming out of China in terms of uh, concealing of, of, of information in the beginning, not access to the WHO, etc. So there's a question about the importance of local rule of law and compliance by Chinese investors and entities. Does anyone want to jump on that one first? <laughs> Eka, go ahead. And why don't you unmute? Uh, yes, uh, I'll maybe continue what I've mentioned already. That um, what our experience, at least, was quite clear that when the country itself has all the prerequisites for the rule of law and clarity of the level playing field, uh, rules of the game that are clear for all the investors and economic actors, they comply with that. So we haven't seen any arm wrestling from the Chinese companies at the time that I can recall myself in terms of pushing through the system or undermining the rule of law, trying to bribe the courts who couldn't have been bribed, for example, or having special deals from the government. But what I can say, knowing experience in different other countries, is that if there are opportunities for that, they did take advantage of that, so that it's not that they, they would mind. So uh, the responsibility rests with the state that is a recipient state. And I like to Western investors that are keen to look as a, as to, into the rule of law as a, as a factor of security for their investments, that through business associations or their embassies or, or geopolitical sort of connectivity with their own states, they would try to push for more clarity of the rule of law and framework. You don't see that from the Chinese companies, obviously. So for the countries who are in transition in that sense, as much as there is diversity and dominance, I would say, of investments and with that demand for rule of law that comes with it so that they could invest more, it's more beneficial. So if that would be my wish, I would wish for Chinese companies to have that requirement as well so that every investor that comes to my country has that understanding that rule of law serves the interests of everybody. And if there is a level play field, which is fair, predictable, that gives security to everybody and sustainability for investment. Um, and in that sense, Western investments obviously uh, bring that more uh, that comes with the, with, the, with the policies, with culture, and even at the level of conditionalities that we can see from IFIs as well when the microfinancial aid or, or otherwise financial aid that is um, designed for the countries and then projects which, which come from those institutions. Does anyone else want to add to that? No? Okay, then I have a... a George, were you about to say something? No, I was, I was about to say that, I mean, echoing exactly what Eka said in the sense that a lot depends on the individual country. I mean, in, in our case, of course, you have the EU legal framework um, that is binding. Um, it is a different case in countries in Africa, for example. Uh, and th that's why the, the importance of multilateral rules around uh, uh, loans and conditions attached are very important. And, and that's an issue that, that I think... It's not for our discussion now, but it's, it's a very important issue around Chinese investment around the globe. Great. 
We have just uh, three or four minutes left. Um, this is a question for Iftikhar. How do you see China threatening Bangladesh with reprisal if it is consider if it considers any participation in the Quad? Has there been a warning that this would lead to a degrading of bilateral ties? Do you have any insight uh, into that? Uh, no, I, I mean that's our foreign policy. I mean, look, we, 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 no, I, I, I don't see China. I, I've read in your report and there was a distinct media about Chinese ambassador saying something about court. I mean, of course, ambassador is a sovereign representative of his flag. I mean, ambassador has the right to say anything he or she likes uh, uh, in the foreign office or even in public. I mean, uh, but it, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, China cannot be serious about that. I mean, this is our, our sovereign uh, right to decide what we want to do. Uh, uh, but uh, we do not necessarily want to self-destruct ourselves either. So, so there, is, there was, if, if the Chinese are uh, 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 concerned about that, at this point in time, I'd uh, advise them to rest their concerns because <laughs> that is not uh, uh, justified in terms of realities of, of, of the international situation at this point in time. Um, otherwise, yes, no, the Chinese don't put pressures like that. They do, they do it very subtly. I mean, they would not go to public and make statements like that unless it's a it's a challenge of the language. But uh, but they do put subtle pressures as all countries do. I mean, uh, but that we are we are in the business of diplomacy and international relations for that reason, in order to be able to withstand pressures and at the same time apply pressures of our own where we can to our advantage. Even to bigger players like the United States. <laughs> So, so we've we've had a pretty wide ranging discussion here on a lot of different aspects of investment from China and what you'd like to see from the U.S. But we have just a couple of minutes left, and I just would like to ask each of you very briefly um, if you, you know, have like one word of advice to the U.S. and the EU for what kind of investment or what approach to investment before what you've already said, because I know uh, you know you've already mentioned a few things you want. You don't want easy loans. You want, you know, there to be conditionality. You want, you know, rule of law to be upheld. Is there anything else that you would like to add to what you've already said about what kind of EU and U.S. investment would be a welcome alternative to what China has offered? Can I make a quick response? 30 seconds. Yeah, I see some of these questions about countering China or the European Union, how the European Union can counter or America can counter. We don't want you to counter, but to complement. Uh, the whole idea is how you can complement it and we work together towards that you see so this idea of uh, one countering the other should be left out that there shouldn't countries shouldn't have to be making a choice between one making, and the other. making a choice i mean it's not a uh, you know uh, uh, it's sort of this uh, uh, million dialogue that you know we spoke of greek culture and all that sort of like in milos you go and say that you're with sparta and you're not with athens and you're against us and we'll destroy you otherwise no i mean you know, um. Okay. If I may, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, if if I may add, uh, when when it comes to to countries like Georgia, uh, we already are in this extremely painful and difficult zero sum game imposed on us by Russia. So that we would rather have no other angles of zero sum games that we could be uh, dragged into. So that's obviously an aspiration. But when it comes to more investments and attention. Uh, in, in the era of hybrid wars and warfares, I would, uh, I would hope for more uh, in-depth engagement and investment into the cybersecurity and cyber development of our countries and preparation of our markets and human resources to the new economy that is already upcoming with artificial intelligence, with the new, new era that is so distanced in so many ways from the countries like Georgia. We still live and think through the prism of what the economy was and is as we know it, but it's not going to be there already tomorrow. And we need to be ready for that, for us to have a, any competitive edge and chance of survival. And US and EU would be the best feed for us to get ready, prepared, and then be resilient to those changes and then potentially even benefiting from that. And finally, George. And and you're muted, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I would uh, I would say two things. One uh, is work within the multilateral system, um, and we've I think we've we've seen very painfully how 
difficult it becomes when you when the US as it did under the previous administration adopted a purely transaction transactional approach to to international uh, economic relations um within that do not be naive but don't be obsessed either uh or clearly uh, echoing uh, what what Eka said i mean in 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 everything that is digital and cyber, of course, there's going to be a very fierce competition. And of course, China will try to find advantage. And we see that, you know, it, it, it also had uses domestically. So, you know, within work within the rules, but don't be uh, uh, obsessed while not being naive. And I would also say, given say an aside uh, to our European Union partners, which is finally get uh, together to decide on a common uh, policy towards China, which is distinct from the one of the US, complementary, distinct, uh, uh, based on our values, uh, but also trying to uh, uh, position the EU in, in, in the global environment as uh, an equal partner to the other two poles. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, thanks to all of um, our panelists for this rich and wide-ranging discussion about an important and complex uh, set of issues. Um, I do recommend these two reports on China's influence in South, <clears throat> in South Asia and in Southeastern, Central and Eastern Europe. They're available at carnegieendowment.org. And you'll also find their details on two more launch events for these reports, one in each of the regions. So it will be a deeper dive into the specifics in each region. Um, thanks to you all for your time and attention. Um, look forward to seeing you at, at future events. Thank you. Thank you.